our world is changing rapidly. As an engineer and technologist, I'm really fascinated with all the emerging technologies that make our lives simpler. With Uber, you can become a taxi driver of your own car within a week. In London, to become a cab, a cab driver, you have to pass an exam to prove that you know the streets of the city. Wikipedia even says it's like having an atlas of London implanted in your brain. In 2011, Eleanor Maguire published a brain imaging uh, paper showing that it's actually nearly the case. The brain volume of London cab drivers is nearly 50% larger in the region where they memorize maps. With Google Maps, we don't need to remember our routes. And without Google, we get lost. Usually, it's not such a big deal. But having spent the last 15 years of my life designing technology to help people with brain disorders, I'm starting to get increasingly concerned about a series of recent results that I would like to share with you. In primary schools, children get more and more often digital tablets to write things down. And they have to type their homework on a computer. But more and more research is showing that actually this reduces their learning capacity. For some reason we don't understand, learning how to write helps us to memorize more words and to remember things better. In Germany, a nationwide study showed that children who spend too much time using digital devices develop attachment, developmental, and language development disorders, as well as hyperactivity. And in another study, it was shown that 2.6% of teenagers are suffering from social media addiction, leading to apathy, lack of sleep, and in one-third of the cases, depression. South Korean scientists have even measured neurotransmitter changes that are similar to what is normally observed in drug addiction. So, it makes you wonder, where is this leading us? Is technology failing us, or are we failing here? Let me take you back a little bit in time. No, no not that much. Um, <laughs> there. <laughs> when I was a boy, walking to school, I had those questions. Why are we thinking? What are thoughts even? You know, what makes me me? And why am I still myself when I wake up in the morning? 30 years later, the BBC broadcasted a documentary series entitled Brain Story, presented by Susan Greenfield. Finally, I was getting some of the answers on the questions I was struggling with when I was a kid. But in return, I got many more other questions. At that moment, I decided I have to make a change and do something that is related to the brain. But how was that going to happen, given my lack of relevant knowledge as a physics engineer? Luckily, some of my colleagues around the world were starting to use microtechnology and microfluidics, the things I was doing as well, for biology. So there was some hope. And indeed, on that morning in the fall of 2004, I came to work and found on my desk three research proposals. My manager at Philips Research back then thought they might be the right challenges for me. One of them was entitled Implantable Neurostimulation. I was back on track to pursue my boy's dream. 
Soon, with my team, we started to work on developing a new version of brain pacemaker to help people suffering from Parkinson's disease. A couple of years earlier, that therapy, which is called deep brain stimulation, was introduced in the United States. Let me show you a short movie displaying its effects. It's always incredible to see the enormous relief of that man when he brings the controller on his chest, activates the pacemaker, and his trembling recedes. Now you've seen the effect of this, this kind of pacemaker. I'm sure you will be amazed to hear that less than a few percent of Parkinson's patients actually receive one. Why? Well, here, is the first reason. You have to lie down with your head locked into a metal frame while the neurosurgeon is accurately inserting the electrical probe into your brain. And because the surgeon needs to check that the therapy will work there, you have to stay awake during the whole operation and you can't take your drugs against Parkinson, so you are exposed to the full effect of your disease. No wonder that people are scared at taking that intervention. But in return, the positive side is many of them come to the hospital in a wheelchair and after recovery, they leave walking. So there's an actually another reason to which we could do something, we thought. I have to explain you a little more on how deep brain stimulation works here for you to understand where side effects come that so many people suffer from. 15 to 30% of the people have side effects like uh, tingling sensation in the skin, eye deviation, muscular contractions, and so on. The region of the brain where mild electrical pulses have to be sent is shown here uh, as a bright region called target. We want to cover this area with as much current as we can. When we started working on this problem, the electrodes that were used were fairly large, like displayed on top of the picture, and they were distributing the current equally in all directions, like this. So that when the electrical probe, the little gray disk, would be a little bit misplaced by only a millimeter or so like that, the currents would actually spread outside the intended target and invade another region shown in blue here. And if that region takes care of your eye control, well, your eyes will suffer from deviation. With my team, we thought we could use microtechnology to do something about that. We designed smaller electrodes that would be dotting the tip of the electrical probe. This allowed us to control the shape of the electrical currents and make sure that more current would go on the target and as little as possible would cause side effects. This allowed us to really improve deep brain stimulation and to inspire new devices so that more people in the world could have access to this therapy. What really drives me in this technology is that it gives people a humane life again. And that is characteristic of medical technology. By bringing together engineers, medical doctors, psychologists, ethicists, we make sure that we improve the effect and reduce or even suppress the side effects. And this brings me back to the worries about digital technology, which is accelerating in all compartments of our lives. Take, for instance, 
artificial intelligence, and machine learning. In 2011, Watson, the, intelligent, the artificial intelligence software developed by IBM, won the US quiz show Jeopardy against two of the most legendary human players. The game of Go is presumably the most complex game that we know of. When the chess champion Garry Kasparov lost to IBM's Deep Blue in the 90s, Go remained as the last frontier. And indeed, by 2014, still no computer had managed to beat a professional Go player until Google arrived and decided to tackle the problem. Last year, the number one world ranking professional player of Go was beaten by AlphaGo 3 to 1. So, what's in store for us? Will AI take over? Some very big entrepreneurs have decided not to let this to chance. Elon Musk, with Neuralink, wants to connect our brains to the cloud in order for us to keep control of artificial intelligence. Brian Johnson from Kernel aims at finding a way to supercharge our brains so that we can keep up with the machines. And Dmitry Itzkov, with the 2045 initiative, is working to develop an artificial brain in which humane personality can be transferred at the end of one's life, virtually making us immortal. How this should work? How would it feel like for us? No one knows. How would it affect us? Would we still need to sleep or ever dream? Would we still be ourselves when we wake up in the morning? Nobody knows. But sure thing, very smart people are getting a lot of money to try and make it work. It seems we are on a train that can't be stopped. And maybe it shouldn't be stopped. Most of us benefit from technology development. And if you're so unfortunate as to get a disease like Parkinson's, well, anyone should get a technology that helps them to regain their humane lives. So, this brings me to the biggest contrast here. Medical technology follows very strict practices to make sure that it helps people and it doesn't affect them negatively. Digital technology doesn't have those practices. And so, as it's accelerating and invading all the aspects of our life, we should really wonder, is it affecting us or not? And you should remember the examples I gave you that really give us evidence that this doesn't work like we should. Children having their learning ability affected by using digital tablets, development disorders, and teenagers um, getting dependent on social media. I think that technology development only brings progress if it helps us to be more human. And we can, can take example to medical technology and change it so that we integrate other fields of science in the process of technology development. Technology development should include biology and applied neuroscience in order to respect the nature and needs of our bodies and brains instead of overflowing them or depriving them. Technology development should include cognitive and behavioral sciences in order to benefit our personal development and growth and that of our children. Technology development should include philosophy, moral and ethics in order to explore and support who we are and what makes us human. Instead of taking us over, 
The resulting technology would improve our lives, serve our true needs, and help us to be more human. Together, let's create humane technology.